Good morning. Good morning. Um, I got an early morning slot right after the first night parties, so uh, thank you for being here. I understand that may have been harder for some than others. Um, don't know if you know this, but when you're speaking at RSA, one of the things that they give you in terms of guidance for presenters is not to give a whole long bio about yourself, which I am absolutely not going to do, um, except for one sentence. Um, this is my first time doing this, so please be kind. Um, and before my current billet at JetBlue Airways, um, New York's hometown airline, uh, I did 20 years in the vendor space, specifically in products, hardware, software, and managed services around Threat Intel, and I am here quite literally to tell you um, that it can be done on a shoestring, and I am, I'm sort of on a mission to say, we need more intel in security, we need more people in security, and I am uh, undertaking as part of this um, effort uh, to give away everything I know and tell you what I have learned. So um, with that, let me get started. I assume no one wants to see or ask questions about the legal disclaimer. So, um, a, a note about taking notes. Uh, I am going to cover some resources, various websites and tools in this talk. You do not need to write them all down. I would much rather you pay attention to the context, the 20 years of mistakes that I have made and we have a conversation. There are three, way, three things we've tried to do to make that easier. One, in addition to the slides you will see today, there are 12 slides at the back as additional resources with do's, don'ts, and how to apply the things that I'm talking about. So you'll get these slides plus those 12. Um, second, there is a single link at the end of the talk where every website I mention, every free tool I talk about, and my notes on each of those things are all included in a single web page. So you don't have to furiously write down tools or websites or URLs. Um, and third, <clears throat> Uh, there's a saying I like very much that says a fool never learns from his mistakes, a smart man learns from his mistakes, and a wise man learns from other people's mistakes. So I am here to share with you 20 years of mistakes in hopes that um, you can take away and avoid some of the pitfalls and get to the good stuff. So uh, my point is take notes on what you like, but you don't need to write down any of the tools or links that I'm going to talk about. Okay. Um, Another bit of guidance they give speakers is challenge the audience with an opening statement. So I said, okay, everything that you know about Threat Intel is wrong. Uh, this is a guy from who's been doing Threat Intel for 25 years. So a lot of the misperceptions in Intel, about using Threat Intel to help drive security, especially in smaller and mid-sized companies um, that are not Fortune 500s, that do not have huge consumer-facing brands, is that that is a big company thing. It isn't, it doesn't need to be, and the reasons that that misperception often exists are these. First, um, they think it costs a lot of money, which I'm gonna show you, it doesn't have to. They think it takes a lot of uh, fancy trained experts, which you can become quickly and easily and over time. Uh, they think it requires a lot of expensive and specialized tools, which it doesn't, and I'm going to cover that. Um, and they think it's really hard, you need to be really sophisticated as a security program to use it. None of those things are true. One of the most interesting things um, for me, so before I accidentally stepped in security, I'm actually an MBA bean counter guy by background. And the, the perception that you need trained experts, that you need a lot of high cost tools, you need to buy a lot of feeds, um, and we could argue about our feeds Intel at all, um, is actually driven more by economics than reality in 2023. In 2015, it may have been true. In 2010, it may have been true. But I will tell you that here's the problem that you run into with Threat Intel um, when you suffer from, I'm telling you, the misperception that it needs to be very costly. Um, the economics are these. A lot of the firms that specialize the, in this and do this well, and there are many, and I actually am a fan of and a customer of many of them, um, but a lot of them came into existence when doing what we're going to talk about was really hard and was really expensive, so they had to raise a bunch of money. The people who gave them that money expect a return. To get that return on a big pile of money, they need to have a very high sticker price and a lot of customers, so they tailor their tools and their products to people who can afford the sticker price, right? By necessity, they are pricing out everyone in the mid-market and below. But in 2023, trust groups and open source tools and freeware have come so far that you can actually do a lot of what they do if you are a smaller firm, if you are a smaller brand, if you are a smaller footprint, without spending all of that money. <clears throat> so that's um, the, the kind of perverted economics 
Um, and of course, for those vendors, it, it is axiomatic that it costs 75% as much to win a small customer as a large customer, so why would I go after a $10,000 customer instead of a $100,000 customer? The result is mid-tier mid companies think they can't afford those expensive, high-cost Intel services because they can't, and the vendors don't cater to them because they need the big dollar customers. All of the incentives are wrong for a mid-market security team trying to defend their company. So let's get into um, the, what I call the usual suspects. Now, as I said, I know many of the leading providers in this space. I've worked at some of them, and I have friends there, and they do a great job. And if I have a, a, you know, a Fortune 500 enterprise with a large brand portfolio and a huge attack surface and a reputation and billions in, in market value and a security program that can afford these things, absolutely, I would love to work with many of these vendors, and I currently do. Um, however, it is also important to understand that doing what we're going to talk about today, which is a, essentially a homebrewed Intel program, is still way better than nothing. And if I was not able to, or was denied the budget, say, next year, to engage with these high-cost vendors, would I rather do it with my fingers and a cup of coffee than nothing? Absolutely. Can you do a very good job with your fingers and a cup of coffee and nothing else? Absolutely. So um, if you are able to engage with these types of vendors, that's terrific. By all means do. And offstage, you can ask me what my opinions are. Um, on each of them, um, but in some ways, the bigger companies do have it easy. They've got budgets, they've got people to, to work all this stuff. So, obligatory, um, adorable animal picture. So what is a little guy to do? So, there are actually some advantages to being a smaller firm, and there are actually some advantages to having a smaller program, because it generally means if you are not a huge enterprise, if you don't have one or a portfolio of massive customer-facing brands to defend, if you don't have a sprawling, accretive network that has grown through acquisition and organic growth over 20 or 30 or 50 or 100 years, and you've got PII and PHI and sensitive data spread from here to breakfast, um, that can actually be an advantage. So here are um, some of the other pros that you may not think of when it comes to doing, doing Intel for a smaller or mid-market company. Generally speaking, you tend to have a smaller attack service, and we're gonna talk about how you can take advantage of and monitor that. Um, it's also true that, generally speaking, you are a lesser target. Now, um, one of the interesting things is that the company where I work today, we have a number of separate business units, and I actually congratulated the folks running one of them the other day because we saw a sudden increase in look-alike domains and phishing campaigns and all this stuff, and I said, that's because you clearly come far enough to be on someone's radar. You've become a target, right? So being a smaller firm and having a smaller attack surface, whether that is speaking in terms of your brand, um, your network size, your public-facing internet assets, all of these things are uh, potentially actually an advantage. Now, there are a couple of cons to being a smaller firm, of course. Smaller budget, smaller team. Um, I would argue, though, that a lot of what you need to do to defend that smaller brand and that smaller attack surface can actually be done with the kind of money that you can fold in your pocket, and I'm going to prove it in the next 25 minutes. So stick with me. Okay. Um, a functional Intel program, and by functional, I mean uh, if you're not familiar with the intelligence cycle, you can Google it later, but it means you collect on a specific requirement, you distill that information into something usable, and you do something about it, okay? And a functional Intel program can consist of the following three critical tools, an RSS reader, an inbox, and in my case, lots and lots of caffeine. So that's actually all you need, and none of this, except the coffee, costs any money. <clears throat> so. How does an Intel program start if you don't have one? It starts from requirements. I've, I've learned and heard 100 pithy quotes over the last 25 years. Here is the number one that stuck. I repeat it so often, my team is sick of hearing it. A problem well-defined is half solved. That is the number one thing that has stuck with me through all of my career changes. And so an Intel program must begin with a requirement. That's a term of art. It basically means a care about. And if you cannot take information, distill it into something actionable, and take an action or make a decision, it's not Intel, it's bathroom reading. So what we need first 
is for our security team or other stakeholders. It can be fraud, it can be marketing, it could be brand management, it could be legal, it could be senior leadership, it could be uh, private investors or shareholders. Someone has a care about where making more informed decisions will help them. That's a requirement. And then you decide, where can I go get information that will help me distill something usable out of it and provide it to that stakeholder so that they can make a decision. That in our biz is called a priority intelligence requirement or PIR. I have 12 examples of, you know, this is not strategic, the war in Ukraine kind of intel. This is daily block and tackle for a cybersecurity team. These are, these would be my 12 first PIRs if I was starting a program from scratch. I have started a program from scratch. These were my first 12 PIRs. The other thing you see here is an implementation tracker. It's really important to get even one of these things all the way through the cycle from defining a requirement, identifying sources of information, onboarding those sources, whether they cost money or not, figuring out how to process the information in a consistent way, producing an output, a deliverable, an alert, an instruction, an automated script that does a thing, and then implementing that so that when that cycle comes across your desk, it goes to closure. Now, I happen to use Harvey balls, if you're familiar with those little circles you divide in quarters. I like using Harvey balls because if I take those four steps and Harvey balls have four quadrants, I get pretty granular instant visual on how the team is progressing on going all the way to a mature end-to-end -end process for a single requirement. And that's really helpful because, generally speaking, these things get done in parallel and it's easy to lose track of where you are. These are just 12 examples. I aspire by the end of this year for context at a larger enterprise to have somewhere between 30 and 60 continuously produced Intel streams around 30 to 60 PIRs. I'm at about 25 right now. Okay, so let's talk about the 12 in detail. And again, I'm gonna show a lot of websites, I'm gonna show a lot of tools, I'm gonna mention them, but this talk is not meant to be a list of links that I could have emailed you after the talk. What I wanna provide is the, that um, learn from other people's mistakes is the 20 odd years of context around each of these. So, anyone who reads any security no news knows that N percent of all breaches come from compromised credentials, usually um, due to bad password hygiene, too slow rotation of passwords, and or lack of multi-factor authentication. Um, can you get a bead on some of the passwords or credentials that tie to your mail domain, like you know, eric at eric.com, without spending a lot of money on the recorded futures and flashpoints of the world? Yes, you can. Do they do a better job? Yes. If you can afford them, great. But don't think that you can't get somewhere without spending a nickel. Um, Intel X is a freemium model. You get some data for free. You want to upgrade, they'll charge you some money. Um, Snoo Space is the same. Have I been pwned? Uh, actually, the, the guy who, who built that ultimately open sourced it. They scrape up breach packages from the dark web. They parse out all the credentials. Um, the one thing you need to know about Have I Been Pwned uh, is when you sign up for it, they will only authenticate you by sending back to you at one of five predetermined addresses. Uh, security at, uh, CISO at, something like that. So you may actually have to create a mailbox just to receive the validation email. However, it's not bad. Um, and again, as long as you work at the domain you want to monitor, so you can't steal credentials for somebody else's website, um, it's free. Um, don't forget, Google Alerts are your friend. Stuff does show up in, in the things that Google indexes. There's, it costs you nothing. Set up a Google Alert. And if you sign up for a free account on Pastebin, where samples of stolen credentials are dumped as a marketing tactic, um, you get three custom alerts in the free tier of service. And if you want to upgrade, it's a few bucks a month. The next one is um, security news. And I use that term broadly. This is everything from ZDNet to every security researcher with a blog. So this is a side-by-side. -side. I'm not going to name and shame anybody, but I will tell you that on the left-hand side is a high-cost uh, vendor that raised tens, at least tens of millions of dollars in capital, 
and they do cover Telegram and Discord and the dark web and a bunch of things that an open source surface web tool will not. So let's take the dark web and the hacker forms, put those aside for a second. For pure open source, news, security blogs, anything with an RSS or Atom subscription, anything you can turn into a Google alert, and by the by, there are a number of websites out there that will turn any website or blog that doesn't have an RSS feed, it will RSSify it for you. I put it all into a little tool called Feeder, I will name them. Um, after I made these slides, they raised the price of the paid version, I believe, to $7 a month. I did an informal one-week bake-off between the six-figure provider and my $6 tool. For open source on a specific set of to topics, vulnerabilities, exploits, um, phishing campaigns, et cetera, I ran a admittedly not rigorous side-by-side. -side. Once I put them both in light mode instead of dark mode, because I can't see anything anymore, couldn't tell the difference, and if I could, the $5 tool did a better job. Um, it will take, by the way, um, in addition to uh, Google Alerts, anything you can sign up for RSS or email, um, you can also jam in their uh, Twitter searches by both following a user and or Boolean search. So POC plus CVE, exploit plus vulnerability, all of that stuff, six bucks a month. It is the best, shameless plug, I don't know them, they're not my friends, it is the best six dollars you can spend to do open source intelligence. Um, Feedly is an alternative, uh, I just happen to like this one. Okay, next. Um, I actually worked at one of the very early online brand protection intel firms in the late 1990s, and I still remember all the news articles about some guy who bought a Coca-Cola related domain, even though he didn't work at Coca-Cola, and the whole world went, oh my God, you can buy a trademarked domain for someone else's brand. And you know, Congress chewed its fingernails for three years before passing the Anti-Cyber Squatting Act. I tell you that story because it is 24 years later, and the domain name space is still rife with uh, brand abuse, fraud, spear phishing, and cyber attacks. So this is one of those places where being a smaller firm with a smaller footprint in terms of brand and visibility is actually an advantage. So if you're Procter & Gamble with 900 brands, each of which can have look-alike domains being purchased daily, right? that's a lot to keep an eye on. But if you're, as a, a company where a friend of mine works, a specialty aerospace manufacturer. They do hundreds of millions in revenue, but nobody's really ever heard of them. But trust me, the Chinese know all the companies in the defense industrial base that make parts for the F-35, and they are on somebody's target list. So there are two ways to tackle look-alike domains. Um, the first is you can look at them at the time of registration. So somebody goes out, pays 10 bucks or less um, for a domain, and it gets added to what's called the zone file, or the master list of domains for .com or .net or whatever. Um, and by the way, because people w will usually notice today if you send them something or you try to drive them to a website that ends in .buzz instead of a .com, .com, .net, um, in my industry, .arrow, right? These are things um, where these things are concentrated. So it turns out you can actually download the zone files for most generic non-country TLDs yourself for free. Every day, if you wish. Now, I wouldn't do it with .com because it's 300 million rows and it's a big download. But if you go once, you sign up at ICANN for a free account. Again, you don't have to write, all the links are in the, the jump link at the back. You sign up for a free account, you download the zone file, and then you just search through it. Now, everything I'm talking about, by the way, I am not a programmer, I'm not a command line guy, you will not hear me say, just write a Python script. I go to those talks and they're like, and then you just download R, and then you run these scripts. And I'm like, yeah, you lost me. I'm not that guy. Everything I'm telling you can be done in a browser or Excel. There's no programming or command line required here. Download it. I use a tool called AstroGrep. It's like grep, which you do do from a command line, in a graphical interface. You type in your brand, you say I want variations, wild cards, stars, question marks, and it searches for you and it tells you all the extant already existing lookalikes that match your brand. And you go, well, we own that one. That is our website. We defensively registered these two, and all the rest are someone else's, and that's bad. Now, if you have a very small cadence of new ones and a very small universe of bad existing domains, my personal recommendation, sorry, is block them all, period. 
block them in your mail gateway, block them in your firewalls, you shouldn't be able to get mail in or browsers out, just no. <clears throat> now, if you are a larger brand, larger visibility, or your brand is a common name, you may need to be on a more regular cadence. So you can either do this once a month or once a quarter, and this is domains that have been registered whether they are live or not. An alternative is to look for domains once someone has assigned them a record in the DNS. So whether they have an A, that's web, MX, mail server, or other records in the DNS, once someone who bought the domain has said, make it work, it will be discoverable by any number of um, automated tools. The one I favor is called DNS Twist. Is that, now, that is a command line tool, it's a Python library, but two people have taken it with the author's permission and put a web UI on it, both of which you can use for free, both of which will export a CS, uh, an Excel file so you can manipulate it in a spreadsheet, and one of which, at least, will actually send you daily alerts for all new lookalikes on your brand and whether any of them have changed, like they didn't have a mail server yesterday and today they do. And by the way, if they have a mail server and no web server, you are about to be spearfished, right? Because there's no reason to set up a mail server for a web that sounds and looks just like yours and no website except to fish you. Um, that one is three bucks a month, right? So I said you could do this with the money in your pocket. Um, if you do know command line, there are all kinds of additional alternatives. They're listed here and at the end. Okay. Um, a lot of those sites are misused for the purpose of phishing, fake login pages for your employees or customers. <clears throat> there are a couple of ways that you can approach this. Here's my favorite. Ever since Google and their Chrome browser and then the rest of the industry basically said, if you don't have an SSL certificate, we are going to warn people not to even visit your website, right? It became TLS by default required. The result of that is that even fraudulent websites looking to defraud your customers or spearfish your employees have to have a cert. Well, CertStream and Census are two free resources where you can search for your brand or your domain name or whatever string you want in certificates. Um, just doing that will often surface lookalikes and fraudulent websites that have gone live because they have a certificate. And another opportunity, and this is a personal fetish of mine, is the 80-20 rule. Um, if you look at the CA, the certifying the certificate authority that is validating your cert for the user when they visit the, and click the little padlock. Generally speaking, companies will work with one CA. So if you see 250 domains with your CA, and then three from another, and two from another, and one from one you've never even heard of, those six look at them right away. Because companies generally don't suddenly go, well, we're gonna do all our certs with VeriSign and Komodo, and then suddenly one appears with a CA in the Far East that you've never heard of. So just looking at the um, extant certificates will often surface things you didn't know were out there. And CertStream is essentially a continuous stream of all new certificates being issued. Uh, you can download free tools, Python library scripts, et cetera, to then uh, chew through that to give you alerts on anything new. So you don't even have to visit the website. You can get the stuff pushed to you. This is a fantastic way to surface fraud and phishing sites you didn't know were out there. Um, okay, PIR number five, the one that everybody asks me about. What about the dark web uh, phrase, by the way, I hate. Um, the one thing I will tell you about the dark web that you absolutely should remember is, there be, what is it, they, here there be dragons. Do not go tromping around in bad guy websites on the dark web on your own without some tradecraft and knowledge. There are a number of ways to work through that. There are um, both free tools and people who are knowledgeable and you can read about it, but don't just go, well, I downloaded a Tor browser and now I'm gonna go visiting all these bad websites. There are a number of reasons for that. One, I volunteered for 15 years at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And a tremendous amount of content that is both disgustingly unpleasant and illegal to even view will show up on your computer if you start tromping around the dark web without knowing what you're doing. So don't do that. Um, the second thing is people will use all kinds of lures of anything they think will interest you to draw you to a website whose real purpose is to get malware onto your machine. 
And the third reason is bad guys who set up dark websites are generally speaking fairly technically savvy and they watch carefully who visits their website. So don't you know, jump on your corporate laptop from your corporate network and go tromping around in the dark web. There are a number of ways to avoid this. Um, I list here and in the follow-up materials both Tor-based search engines and surface web-based search engines for Tor networks that you can use. Again, please, outside the scope of this talk, learn a little about Tradecraft and absolutely use a disposable browser or better yet, a disposable VM. You can get them a number of places. My personal favorite is Chasm, K-A-S-M, where you can spin up a Linux desktop with a Chromium browser on demand in about 10 seconds, do anything you darn well please, and when you close the window, it's gone. So you don't have to worry about malware or attribution or leaving a footprint or anything else. Still, handle with care. Okay, PIR number six. I'm gonna tell you that when you go home and you've been through three days of seven talks a day and you remember absolutely nothing, I am begging you pretty please remember this. If you remember nothing else, with your morning coffee, take out something as sophisticated as a legal pad and jot down the software and providers you know are key to your business. Well, I don't know for sure, but I, I know we run um, you know, Apache web servers, Oracle databases, and um, we're a Microsoft shop, or we run Macs. Like, Whatever you know, put it on a pad. The combination of um, free websites, blogs, and or Twitter feeds from Volmon, CVE Trends, Cisco Talos, New Vulnerability, again, all the links are in the, in the material in the back, you don't need to write it down. Talos, the Zero Day Initiative, uh, CISA's Known Exploited Vulnerabilities List, which is spot on if usually seven to 14 days behind the times, but once they publish, they're right, um, and a set of Twitter alerts for clever Booleans like POC plus CVE and exploit plus vuln. Um, I know, as I said, I have worked at, have been a customer of, or have evaluated nearly every one of those fancy high cost logos I showed at the beginning, and on the particular topic of new vulnerabilities and new exploits dropping, this may be not as good, but I put it at 95% and none of it costs a nickel. So grab a cup of coffee, put these seven things into an RSS reader, scroll through it, and if you see, well, I'm Microsoft, Apache, and Oracle, and keyword search it for the things in your shop, because, and, and this is a, a true story, the time from exploit dropping publicly to being under attack is now typically for a, like a remote code exploitable, really bad CVE is under 24 hours. And I know because we, where I work, we have responded to what I call the big five from last year, Logjam, Spring, Shell, Print Nightmare, Folina, and Confluence. And in, and in at least several cases, we were actually scanned and probed and attacks were attempted less than a day after the exploit was first made public. For a given specific port and protocol, there's a tool called ZMAP that can scan the entire public internet in less than a day. So once one of these things drops, that's put down your coffee, get on the phone, and clang the bell. If you have an externally facing asset with a new CVE for which there is now an exploit, whatever you're doing, stop and do this instead. And this is as good as any paid service I have found to keep you abreast of that. Doesn't cost a penny. Okay, vulnerability checks and other um, review of your own attack surface. This is, I think, the only one where I actually have two slides. They gener these providers generally, or these tools, generally fall into two categories. The ones who are reporting focused. Lots of pretty visuals, stuff for the board, scores and colors and red light, green light, and A through F. And that's great. Selling you one report does not make them enough money. See investor economics from earlier in this talk. Okay. Many of them have figured out that the only way they make business is by selling you 50 of these things on your top vendors. So they will often tease you by giving you the one on yourself for free. So let them. <laughs> Hi, risk recon security scorecard bit site, et cetera. I'd like a free report on myself, please. Any sales rep will probably hop to and get it to you because they go, go boss, I got a hot lead. They offer the free report, take it. Now, take it with a ginormous 
grain of salt because this outside in view and how they scan and what they do, it's full of caveats. If you want to corner me in the hallway and we'll talk about ASM vendors and the latest buzzword bingo, I can do that all day long. And I worked on an ASM product for four years. Um, but if the, the, the ratings say, for example, open ports F, like take them for what they're worth. If there's good stuff in there, the stuff that you should like put down your coffee and yell, take it for what it's worth. They offer the free service, take it. <clears throat> um, the other side are the data focused folks where you don't get visuals and board friendly reports and blah, 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 but they were started by three guys in the garage and the service cost $5 a month. Um, most people know Shodan, a lot of people use it. In fact, a lot of the ASM vendors will put that feed into a nice UI and then charge you a lot of money what you could have paid Shodan 49 bucks for. So don't do that. Um, I actually prefer, excuse me, binary edge. They look a little deeper at vulnerabilities. And again, census, which you do have to sign up for, but the account is free. These are all ways um, to check your own attack surface for open ports, vulnerabilities, low hanging fruit. And again, the most expensive of them is practically lunch money. Okay. Social media. Um, there are a raft of problems with social media, but I'm gonna focus on brand or company impersonation and executive impersonation. Now here's the sad part. Unless you have a personal contact, the abuse at or report a problem um, features on most social media sites are terrible. It's like, I don't think there's anybody on the other end of the mailbox. It's like sending abuse to, a, to an ISP and saying, there's a bad thing on this website. And they're like, yeah, I'll be back to you in a week, right? Terrible. But there are a number of ways you can work through this, even as a smaller company with a low or no dollar budget. One is, if you are large enough and you are in a critical infrastructure sector like transportation or banking, um, you have what's called an ISAC. Uh, created by presidential directive. These are intelligence and information sharing groups for the 16 critical infrastructure sectors. If you're in one of those sectors but you're not big enough to afford a membership, one, contact the ISAC and ask if they've got a you know, low cost entry, little company option. If they don't, network like crazy, you probably have contacts who work at companies that are ISAC members. And um, see if they have contacts at the LinkedIn's and Facebook's of the world Personal relationships and closed trust groups often get stuff done way faster than official channels shamelessly take advantage of that. Um, the other thing is that many of the vendors who do takedowns uh, in the social media space, they make their money on volume. If they've never heard of you and you're like, I got one problem a year, call them up, see if they'll give you a freebie, right? They'll do demonstration of capability. It costs them nothing, right? Um, a one-off, worst case scenario, 50 bucks, 100 bucks, whatever. By the way, when you take a, when someone raises an issue like this with a bad domain or a social media site and you say, oh, okay, we'll, we'll get counsel on the phone, they'll send a cease and desist letter. I'm like, you're gonna pay a lawyer $450 to send a letter to a Russian criminal. Please stop abusing my brand. Oh yes, very nice, ha ha ha. Yeah, d d just tell your management to save their money. Okay, next. Um, this is one I really love. Actor TTPs, where the rubber really meets the road for a lot of security teams on the detection and response side rather than the prevention side is understanding, well, prevention too, is understanding what attackers are doing, the latest attack techniques, uh, the latest um, uh, kill chains, and you actually will find that if you set up your feeder with the right 50 sources, my starter list of 50 sources is in the backing material, um, and a handful of very specific websites, like all the security vendors who establish their bona fides by blogging about, oh, here's a complete line-by-line -line breakdown of this attack. Take all that stuff in, find someone on your team who wants to read it. Um, my personal favorite is the dfirreport.com. These are line-by-line, millisecond-by-millisecond, command-by-command breakdowns from initial access to mandiant report on the desk. Like soup to nuts, they cover and describe everything, and MITRE attack technique, tag every step of the chain. Now, when I started reading the DFI report a, a, a few years ago, truth is, it was like me reading car magazines at 12. I didn't understand half the words, 
right? I don't know how to bolt a transfer case to a drive shaft, but I just kept reading them. By the time I was 15, I understood everything. And that's what I've done with, with the FIR reports, right? Now I can understand all the technical stuff that I just let wash over me. Um, so these are um, all available for free and are often very timely and will give you everything from how they gain initial access, you know, the, the poison Google ad for the downloadable software contained this, which launched a uh, bash script, which did an additional download, which wrote and executed a PowerShell script, which downloaded Batloader, which hop, 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 royal ransomware, right? And they will take you through every step of the chain and show you how to break it or how to detect it with um, all the things you need to make SIM rules or uh, detections for your EDR console or whatever. Um, one other thing, if, there is a, if there's a specific technique you're concerned about, look for someone who has a detection rule for it. Look at um, SOC Prime or uh, sites that, um, for the Splunk community, Elastic. There may be a detection for a tool you don't have, but if you can read their detection, you can often suss out the logic and then just convert it to whatever syntax or tool you actually do use. Almost done. Um, I do want to leave time for Q&A. So, a um, lot of estimates that something between 10 and 20% of all data breaches are because someone misconfigured a cloud service. Storage buckets. Um, there are no good services out there. Strangely, the only three I have found are free, free, and low cost. <laughs> there isn't a high cost service that I have found for this. Um, Gray Hat Warfare has a free tier, has a 25 euro tier. Depending on how often you show up and what you see in your free searches, you may or may not decide that the 30 bucks is worth it. Um, that's the best and most expensive of the bunch. OSINT.SH um, has a public bucket search. You can search for keywords, document types, all that kind of stuff. And my personal favorite, um, just to make sure you guys are awake, Anybody, shout out the URL if you know it for how to get to image search on Google. Anybody? Images.google.com. How about news on Google? News.google.com. Did anybody know that Google has a cloud bucket search? No, and I'm pretty sure that's by design. You know why? That's the URL. No kidding. <laughs> Obviously not something they intended the broad public to use. <laughs> That's why I had to do backing material, because no one's going to write that in their notebook. That is actually the URL for Google's cloud bucket search. OK. My personal, like, I love this one, subdomain enumeration, your own attack surface. Oh, we have uh, mail dot and dub 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 and commerce and login and partridge in a pear tree dot our site dot com. Cannot tell you how many times the business or a hackathon or a marketing partner will launch FQDNs and not mention it to the security team. Sometimes even the IT team doesn't really know except the folks who manage DNS because the entire subdomain is built and run by a third party. Enumerate your own attack surface from a domain perspective. Can you do that for free? Absolutely. In the backing matter are my six favorite links. None of them are perfect. I personally will run all six put the six columns in a spreadsheet, do a little Excel magic. By the way, there is a template in the backing blog post where you can download an Excel file that will compare lists, um, rip FQDNs out of full path URLs, rip domains out of email address, a bunch of useful stuff for cleaning up data. Um, download two, three, four, five, six of these lists, mash them and deduplicate them, and you will get probably as good enumeration as most paid services, and it will cost you nothing but five minutes. Um, if you're a command line person, a mass and subfinder and some other tools are also available to do this, but everything in the back matter that you, will, you can download is all free and it is all GUI based and text file export, CSV, do stuff in Excel. <clears throat> um, finally, machine readable IOCs. I put this last because industry veteran rant for another day, IOCs are in my opinion not Intel. They are short-lived, relatively ephemeral indicators, but they do have uses. So if you want to get me in the hallway and talk about why hashes are OK, full path, full path URLs are not bad, hashes are OK, domains have a useful TTL measured in days, and IP addresses, unless you know they are relevant to you for the next five minutes, my opinion of them is 
don't bother. Um, there is a list of some sources, including the one on um, threatfeeds.io, which gives you links to like 30 other sources. So if you want atomic indicators, by all means help yourself. Here's my admonition on that. For detection, okay. For blocking, be very selective. Remember your admiralty scale, if you know, A A1 through F6, quality of the source, reliability of the information, because woe betide the security geek who accidentally brings the business to a stop. Finally, I said that the little guys don't get to play with the big money vendors. Actually not true. Uh, Periscope from Intel 471, which is the latest um, hot vulnerabilities and exploits, um, weekly top things and campaigns you need to worry about, Digital Shadows, Intel 471, Flashpoint, Xerofox, they all have free versions of their paid services, which you can sign up for because their marketing teams want your email in a database. So take them at their word. And by the way, to keep all this straight, you already have a tip, a Threat Intel platform. It's called Outlook. Is that the best tip in the world? No. But between Outlook and folders and foldering rules and a good RSS reader like Feeder, you actually have the tools to do all of this, and now you have some idea of both the sourcing and the do's and don'ts for how to do all of this. And if you add up all the best of everything I've shown you, you probably come in under 300 bucks a month. And you can do it all, all, for free if you're willing to give it a little time. Um, so, what to do next? Um, here's what I would say. Find a care about. I don't care what it is. Compromise credentials, localized domains, your management cares about something, your brand team cares about something. Find one thing. Define a requirement, pick a source, and take it all the way through my Harvey balls. Source it, bring it in, figure out how to vet and process it efficiently, figure out the deliverable output, and figure out how to create value for the business when you get it. Hey boss, there was a lookalike domain, I got it in, I looked at it, it's hosted on a Russian IP, here's what we should do. Block it at the mail gateway to stop inbound phishing emails, block it outbound at the firewalls or on the desktops so that no one goes there. Um, there, I have actually added value by reducing risk to the business. Right? Start super small, but take it from start to finish and show that you can create value in the form of risk reduction. That's where I would start. As I said, um, there are 12 more slides behind this, and everything I talked about, including links, is at opensourcery.io, a website I basically put up for the purpose of providing you that link, so be kind about the website, if you would. Um, but there's a contact form, you can DM me with questions. opensourcery.io slash blog slash RSAC. That is literally where you will find everything I have talked about today, and notes, and the Excel template, and anything else, just send me a message. I, I want to give, I love this stuff. I want to give away everything I know. Questions? Uh, Jeff Carpenter. Hey, Jeff. Uh, are there any requirements you have where you found uh, you couldn't find any free sources or the free sources available, or cheap sources available were too low quality to be useful? Yeah, um, thanks for the question, Jeff. Um, so as I said, um, where there are no good answers, um, the cloud search, like bucket misconfigurations, that kind of stuff. And when you move from pure like sock level stuff to what in the term of art are called tactical and strategic, right? If you actually, there are incredible sources out there. Um, I'll give you an example from another part of my life. I actually sat at a console that used mobile phone data, geographic concentration data, and I watched the buildup of Russian troops on the Belarusian border for months. That kind of data ain't free, but you'd be shocked at how low cost it's available. So um, when you move into things that are tactical or strategic, either to a, a large enterprise or at the geopolitical level, you're gonna pay, you know, commercial overhead is now astonishingly affordable. Uh, you can have submeter resolution photographs of anywhere on Earth for 900 bucks in 24 hours. Incredible. Um, but you are moving up the, the, the cost chain as you move up the operational to tactical to strategic intelligence production. Yes, sir. I was wondering if you have any recommendations for uh, information sharing resources for maybe a smaller org that's not in a critical industry that doesn't have that government appointed uh, ISAC group? Yes, trust groups um, that are not industry specific but InfoSec specific. So um, ask your network. Just blatantly say, hey, is anybody in a closed Slack channel? Uh, anybody know any industry groups? Um, the Aviation ISAC folks have um, our official portal, but we also have signal chats, right? 
So the folks who do SOC have the SOC channel, and the folks who do fraud have the fraud channel. Um, just ask and network like crazy. Many of them will be by referral only, but I will tell you, having been in a couple of them for years now, um, the intel that you get, uh, the ability to find people who have been just been laid off when you are in a position to hire, and the ability to find new opportunities if you're in a position to need a new opportunity, astonishingly better than anything you will see on Indeed or LinkedIn, both getting people, finding jobs, and trading information. Blatantly ask. If you can get into those trust groups, it is absolutely, there's gold in them, Nar Hills, absolutely. Hi. Hi. Uh, what kind of advice do you have on defining metrics? Uh, it seems that quantifying and qualifying metrics is a little difficult in the Intel space. <laughs> It is. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm only laughing because literally <laughs> metrics in this realm was my B-sides talk in New York three days ago. Nice. And uh, the title was called The Metrics Mess. So that tells you kind of that I come down where you are. I will tell you as the by origin MBA bean counter weenie, um, as much as possible, right, we as practitioners tend to get hung up on the idea of the things we do every day. And I'm here to tell you as the MBA guy, not the security guy, Management doesn't care. They absolutely don't care about, you know, oh, uh, the SIM detection rule leverage the EDR. They don't care. Here's what you say. The metrics that matter to them are, how did we reduce the likelihood of a bad thing happening in whatever quantitative terms you are able to create for that? Did we detect any bad things? And if so, are we getting better at detecting them faster? Did we help ensure compliance? Because in many industries, the regulators will hurt you more than the criminals. The fines can be bigger than the thefts. Did you help ensure cybersecurity compliance, or did you defend the brand? I would argue that everything a security practitioner does in cyber actually contributes to only one of those four things. Prevent the event, detect it faster, defend the brand, help us be compliant. Everything we do from a management view should be one of those four things. Sorry, he, then you, okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Just wondering for super small business where they don't even have a security officer, what's the bare minimum that you suggest they take care of? Um, two things. One, outsource as much as you can, but ask the vendors what they can bring to the table in terms of security and the best endpoint protection you can afford. I'm not here to proselytize for one vendor versus another, but have your workstations with the best what used to be called antivirus software, EDR is the current term, the best you can afford. Um, the other thing I strongly recommend is whatever controls your connections to the internet, um, be as restrictive as possible. Here's an astonishing fact. There, I may have the numbers wrong, but directionally you'll get my point. There are 300 million domains registered. There are 180 million live Apex domains on the internet. Most humans and businesses visit less than 300 of them ever. So the more restrictive you are about going anywhere on the internet except where you know is good, right? The Alexa top thousand and the five companies your company does business with can be all you ever need to touch on the internet. So be as restrictive as possible on connections. Thank you. Sir. So besides the RSS feeds, um, is there, do you know if the tools that you outlined are fairly stable for like API availability or? Uh, Yes, many of them. And some of them, if they don't have an API, so I'll take the RSS reader um, as an example. Um, it can output, obviously you can put RSS into other formats with a transform which you can download for free. Um, you can export the OPML file and take um, its configuration out. Almost everything, even if you have to pay from the freemium to the, the free to the premium model for 10 bucks, Almost everything now that spits out data will have either an API or a some kind of text or CSV download. And if, again, I, I promise this could all be UI based, but if you don't know how, find someone who can, or a bot, because it's that simple, write me a Python script to visit this website every morning, click the download link and put the CSV on my desktop. You can now have a bot do that for you. Um, get the data out. I'm, I, like I said, I'm a bean counter. I put everything in Excel because rows and columns make me happy. Um, Anyway, uh, DM me, hit me up, tackle me in the hallway. I'm out of time. Thank you. I hope this was helpful.